All right, hi everyone. Thank you all, first of all, for being here today. I know that there's a lot of fun out there and being in here is maybe not, as, doesn't sound as fun, but when you have people like this to talk to you, I feel like it's well worth it. And so thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Lindsay Johnson and I am the founder of Lush Life Productions. We are the, the first uh, trademark, just dedicated trade marketing agency. All we do all day is make sure that there are opportunities for bartenders. Um, and we do that with the help of our partners who are spirits brands for the most part, but we work with all kinds of folks across the industry. Um, I'm getting to here first because there's no way I'm getting to all my slides. If you scan that QR code, you can get all of the slides. <laughs> um, there's a lot more information in there than I can give you in, in the 15 minutes I've got. So I'm gonna leave that up for just a second because the next slide is actually just a bio slide which you already saw. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So that's me. Um, I started this company 17 years ago, um, and it was a response to a, a lot of brands not really knowing how to effectively work with and talk to bartenders. If you think back to 17 years ago, there really wasn't much conversation that was happening, right? Um, there were billboards, there were shop people, there were, there's a lot of marketing happening, but there really wasn't a conversation with bartenders. Um, and so many of my friends worked in so many of the incredible cocktail bars here in New York City. Um, and they complained to me that brands really weren't taking care of them and paying attention to them. Um, and I left my job at an ad agency and started this company. Um, when we're taking on a project at Lush Life, we first consider these things, right? So how, how is this project going to benefit the community? Uh, we turn down more work than we take at Lush Life um, because if it doesn't pass this stress test, we're not going to do it. If there isn't a benefit to the community, there's not a benefit to us. We won't do it. Um, education is a really easy way to benefit the community, right? Uh, it's something that your brand probably already has built into its DNA. It's probably something you're already doing. Educating folks is always a top priority at Lush Life. When we looked around at events like this 10 years ago, even five years ago, the audience didn't look like this. It was very homogenous. There were not a lot of people of color, very few women. There wasn't as much space for all of the people who are in this room today, and it's really cool to see all of you. <laughs> um, and it's really important that we build that into all of the work that we do. So what is trade marketing? It's pretty straightforward, and I bet every single one of you in this room knows what it is. Uh, but essentially, it is designing programs that engage and work with bartenders. Um, and this can be bartenders, this can be servers, barbacks, we work with them all, right? Making sure that people who work in hospitality have access to education opportunities and really the stuff they want, um, whether it's space to talk about labor issues or it's just learning how to make a better martini. All of that fits into trade marketing. Um, again, there's so many more words on the slide than I can say here, so <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so some things that trade marketing isn't, but I see all the time. Bullying bars and bartenders into anything, um, going and, and kind of forcing yourself on folks is definitely not a good move. Talking shit about other brands, also a really bad look, don't do it. Um, <laughs> and you know, the stuff that's illegal. So uh, there's a lot of stuff when it comes to compliance that uh, we see laws getting broken every day. Just make sure you're being compliant and, uh, and good. Um, so let's talk about healthy ecosystems. We all work in the same industry and so many of us have the same goals, which are to take care of our guests and to make sure the best possible drink is going across the bar. So we all kind of have to work together to do that. Um, and that, that really involves a whole lot of different stakeholders. Whether we're talking about the bartender community, you're probably going to, to stay compliant. As I mentioned before, compliance, very important. You're probably going to need an agency, a charity, a media partner. Um, your brand team is part of that ecosystem, as are your sales teams. I can't tell you how many projects I work on where I work directly with a brand team, and then we come and say, hey, how do we get this information to your sales team? And the response is, oh, we hadn't thought of that. Can you help us with that? It's, of course, because if we don't have buy-in from everybody on the team, from the ground up, there's no way that any of these initiatives are going to be successful. Um, it's as simple as making like a PDF. And I think in this presentation linked, there is a PDF a version of one of those. 
as I mentioned, mutually beneficial practices. That's the name of the game here, right? Making sure that you're building something that benefits all of those stakeholders I just mentioned. If you build a project that's just good for your brand and not good for the people that you're serving and the community that you're trying to speak to, it's not gonna work. If it's good for the community and the brand, but not your sales team, it's also not gonna work. So you have to build programs that consider all of the stakeholders along the way. This is the boring part, I'm sorry but we have to talk about it. <laughs> um, so lead time, making a calendar. I, I know that so many of us are doing the jobs of five, six, 10 people, hurry late stage capitalism. Um, but that often means that we don't get to the projects that we want to in enough time, right? So very often I get called and told I have two weeks to put together a 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, $200,000 project, right? And I, I just go, okay, we got, we got two weeks to figure out this whole problem that we haven't solved in 10 years. Got it, heard. Uh, and then we get to work. So when you're, when you're considering working with an agency, a charity partner, a media partner, make sure you're giving them enough time to be successful. Um, that's more of a plea on my end than anything else. Um, but also make sure that all of the dates are communicated properly within your teams and also any of your other stakeholders. Making sure people know when things are due. Uh, I, again, I can't tell you how many projects I've worked on where those, those elements aren't communicated to the whole group and then we're all just kind of lost not knowing when things are supposed to be turned in. Um, of course, having somebody who's managing that, whether it be a project manager on your side or hiring an agency to come in and manage it for you is always recommended. Uh, so many projects just fall off the radar, especially projects for the trade, uh, because there's just not somebody managing it and keeping it on the tracks. There are so many moving parts that it feels a little discouraging. A calendar is gonna keep you accountable and is gonna keep things moving. Budgeting, hooray, budgets. Uh, so we all know that budgeting is really tough and we don't always know what things are gonna cost beforehand, but if you don't have a budget, you don't have a roadmap. Um, and knowing what your budget or at least your ballpark budget is before engaging an agency or a charity partner is, is really, really important. If you go to them and say, make me a competition and in your head this costs $5 and in their head it costs a million dollars, it's going to be really hard to get to the middle. If you can communicate beforehand, I have $12, let's go they can decide whether or not that's a project that's gonna be a good fit for them or if it's going to work within their system. Um, if you are starting from a place where that's not being communicated, it's almost impossible to get to a good spot. Expectations are just never going to match. And if expectations don't match, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. Um, you're gonna waste everybody's time, including your own. Um, I always say this, I'm gonna say it again. Add 30% to whatever you think it's gonna cost. If you have a hard amount, like it has to be this many, I understand, definitely budget towards that, but I would budget to 30% less of whatever you think you can spend with that money. You're going, there are gonna be things you forgot in the budget, and more than that, things just end up costing more than you think. And many of these projects have long lead times, right? A project that has a six month lead time, you're looking at a minimum of 10% inflation last year, right? So. All of a sudden, everything just costs 10% more than you and you didn't budget for it. So making sure there's enough money in the budget is really important. Um, the last thing in here is photography and videography. It is so important to have photographs and videos. Uh, that is the number one thing that gets cut from my budgets and it bums me out every time because we're not able to sell the project in as well the next time, not on our end, but for the brand manager, we're not able to tell that story. And if we can't tell those stories, we're really not able to continue the momentum. And often programs take two, three, four years before they're firing on, on all cylinders, right? Um, so it's really important to have proof that you did this really cool thing. And you know, you wanna share that on social media. You wanna, you wanna make sure that you're getting the word out. Okay, so outreach and amplification. Engaged audiences are more important than large audiences. I cannot say this loud enough. <laughs> It is so important. Uh, Umara on my team and I were looking at our open rates for emails yesterday. When I told her they were over 50%, she was like, wait, what? How? And that, that's just the reality of our audience, right? Our audience trusts us, they know us, and they wanna know what we're up to. So they're opening those emails, they're excited about what we have to say. Most email, but like that, that number's nuts, right? Like usually an open rate is somewhere between two and 8%. 
Um, and we, there's a difference between an engaged audience and a big audience is all I'm saying. I'll move on. <laughs> I already mentioned how important diversity and inclusion is. Uh, but it really needs to be a part of your consideration set. If you're looking around and your projects are people who are very well established but all look the same, you're failing somebody. It's really, really important that you consider the entirety of our community. If you look at who actually works behind the bar, the largest communities are not the ones that are often represented at conferences like this or teaching. Um, very often, they're the folks who can't leave the bar to come here, right? They're at work. Uh, so you need to make room for them. You need to figure out how do we engage that community in a way that's both authentic and kind to them and thoughtful. And how do we do it in a way that is also going to make sure that they're able to continue to participate? Um, I use Portland Cocktail Week as an example all the time. When I talk to a, <laughs> a number of, of my friends who are black and brown folks, I was like, why are you guys not going to classes at this event, that event? And the answer was money. So we just stopped charging people to walk through the door at Portland Cocktail Week, right? It's a simple solution. We can find budget elsewhere. Uh, but it's super important, and if it's not part of your consideration set, make it part of your consideration set. Like I said, I'm trying to go real fast, y'all. Okay, so <laughs> parties, trips, trade show, activation, and more. There are so many ways you can market to these audiences, right? There are so many places you can be. You can be right here at this beautiful Park Street booth, pouring your spirits and getting in front of thousands of people. Maybe you want something a little bit more intimate. You wanna have a, a tasting dinner somewhere, right? There are so many ways that you can get in front of people. And going through and figuring out which of these mechanics works best for your brand is really important. And if you don't know, that's okay. There are people out there who can help figure that out for you. Um, the best way, though, to figure that out is being active in the community and knowing what, who it is that you want to serve and what kind of events they want to go to or what kind of programs they want to participate in. Sometimes that's a digital class, right, because they can't get away from the bar. Sometimes that is a big, beautiful event like this. So it's really about figuring out where they're going to be and how you're going to serve them. Um, also, selecting times and dates is really important. Uh, definitely don't have an event like on the Super Bowl. Don't do it, it's bad news. Um, I feel like I have to say that out loud because I get so many invites <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 not that day. That's a bad day for this. Um, as I mentioned before, making sure costs to attend are very low is very important. Gotta remember who we're serving, right? These are folks who for the most part are making 213 an hour plus tips. So if you're charging to walk through that door, you're telling a lot of people that they don't belong and that's not something you wanna do, right? <clears throat> um, also, food and water are non-negotiable. If you are throwing a party and you do not offer food and water, you're, you're messing up, right? You have, to, you have to serve those things. Part of the reason Portland Cocktail Week is in Portland is it's illegal to have an event without food. Uh, so I, to, I don't have to bully people. The state does. Um, also, your drink should be hosted, but you know that already. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so trips. <laughs> I work on a lot of projects where we design trips for bartenders. And... Whew, the pushback I get when I'm like, somebody's got to pick them up from the airport, y'all. Like, this is a country they've never been to before. We, we got to get them from the airport and take them and make sure they're taken care of from start to finish. Um, it's really important to think through the entirety of the program, right? So at every step, who is the person who is going to be providing the hospitality to the hospitality professional? The people you're serving are really good at taking care of people, and they're going to notice if you're not. So you need to think through every single step of that process, whether it's making sure there's somebody to pick them up from the airport or making sure that the dinner, they have a boxed lunch when they arrive so that they have a little food in their belly. This stuff is really, really, really important and often gets overlooked. Um, also be clear on expectations. Um, that's delivering a full itinerary. That's making sure that they have access to all the information on the trip, packing lists, communicate everything beforehand. It's super duper important. I am gonna move on, but there are like a million other things in here. Um, project I am most proud of in the whole wide world is Camp Runamuck, something that we do twice a year. Um, it is the most fun I get to have, and it's also the place where I meet the most incredible bartenders from across the world. From the minute they land in Louisville, Kentucky, until the minute they leave, every one of their needs, needs is met. We pick them up, we drop them off, we take them to distilleries, we feed them. We clothe them, like everything they could possibly need is taken care of. Uh, I love it so much and I'm, I'm really proud of it. So I had to bring it up. <laughs> um, so 
of course, there are other ways to do things, right? So branded classes are things that you all know, you're familiar with, whether they're traveling, whether they're digital, they're very, very effective. Replicatable events, doing the same event in multiple markets. My only, my only flag there is if you're doing the same event in 10 different markets and then you're gonna copy it here at BCB, chances are people have already been to that event and won't come, right? They're not gonna care. Um, and purpose-driven activity. This is a, people care about their communities. If you're doing something that's gonna help puppies in their community, they're probably gonna come, right? Uh, if you're doing something that people care about, they're gonna be more engaged and more excited to be there. So make that space for them to do things that speak to them. Um, this is a case study for us, I'll, I'll move on. Um, Competitions is a place where a lot of brands, I think, fall down. I think this is something that we see as an easy way to get our hands on a lot of contact information and a lot of recipes and a lot of thought starters for our brands. And while that can be true, competitions need to be a place where you're thinking about how, how you're taking care of the community, right? So if, there's, if they have to go spend $1,000 to participate in your competition, you're doing it wrong, right? Um, if it is perceived that it's unfair in any way, you're doing it wrong. Um, competitions are something we as a company didn't do for 10 years because I looked around and I'm like, I don't want to be a part of that. I think that system's really bad. Uh, a friend of mine needed some help and needed me to jump in and help her with a competition. And I trusted her. And I said, if you let us reimagine how competitions work, we're in. Uh, and she let me do that. And we've been doing them ever since. And they can be really effective. But again, it's more about building an experience that matters to people versus extracting as much information as you can from folks. That's the competition we helped on. It was awesome. I would also like to point out the two people who won were women of color who are also queer, only two who have ever won that competition, and they won globals. They're amazing. <laughs> Shout out to AJ and Natasha. Uh, so digital engagement, of course, you all know that you need to be in the digital space. Um, Instagram is the bare minimum. There's so much to get into here, and I feel like... <laughs> Um, you know, I feel like there are a lot of solutions. One of the solutions we came up with is a dis distance learning channel, all free classes for bartenders on our Facebook and YouTube pages. About 3,000 bartenders watch each one of our, our shows there. Um, it's a really great way to get messaging out about your brand or programs that you're working on, especially to reach people who live in Idaho, Montana, places that you aren't probably going to go to. Um, but it also gets to the places that you need to be if, let's say, you're a brand that's here in New York and you only really work in New York, you can geo-target the ads for these classes. We could do that for you. You could do it for yourself. Um, and make sure that the people who are watching it are in that market. Yell at me if I have to stop. <laughs> um, so benefiting the community. If you're doing classes, you need to pay people. You got to pay people to do those classes. Um, Every single person who's been on a Portland Cocktail Week class has paid money for their time. It's really, really, really important. Uh, we also integrate donation to charity for all of our classes as well because we feel like if we're out there promoting education, we should be benefiting someone as well. Um, that one's slightly more negotiable, but paying folks is never negotiable. Um, this is just a project we did that we loved, a digital one. <laughs> uh, so some final thoughts. You're already doing trade marketing work that you're just not taking the bartender lens and applying it. Take, take that bartender lens and look at each aspect of what you're doing. You're putting together an ad series for Drizzly. Hire some bartenders you know to be a part of it. It's super simple, right? There's always a way to integrate the trade into the work you're doing. And if you don't know how to do it, there are plenty of folks who can help. Also, never forget your sales team. I've said this like four times in this presentation in 10 minutes. So, uh, but I just, it's really important. Very often they get left behind and then they get mad and then they don't want to help out. So make sure your sales team's included. Uh, they're a big part of your team. Um, and if you're not getting a diverse group to come to your programs, that's on you. You need to re-examine what you're doing and figure out where you've, you've made the mistake and how you can win back that community or just make space for them. Oftentimes it's just about having made space or not. And that's me, I'm Lindsay.